gonna climb a tree. Watch out. Ah! Hello there. My name is Richard New, and I'll be hosting this uh, episode of the Forbidden Limb Game Podcast. Uh, I have with me, of course, Jeremy Commander, and I have Brian Hink here with me as well. Uh, we're talking today about uh, how to price your game, and we're going to start with Brian, who is uh, with, is one of the designers of Good Cop, Bad Cop, a game that he designed and has marketed himself already. So we're going to start with you. Uh, can you tell us some of the ways that you would... Uh, how you would price your game and how you would uh, make sure that you're going to make money from it. Sure. Yeah, and more importantly, I'm a publisher of it, too, you know, because that, that's who sets the prices, you know, for games, at least for MSRP, you know, so the suggested manufacturer's suggested retail price. So we set that. Um, so, uh, but also, you yeah, have a co-designer and co-publisher, so I've got a, got a partner, too, so I'm just 50% of overworld games. Um, but, yeah, hey, so... <laughs> So um, I'll go over just how you get a game out to a consumer first. So there's a bunch of different ways, kind of the more uh, the more common ways to do it. So one, the simplest way is just directly to a consumer. So I'm a publisher, um, you, so anyone can go to overworldgames.com and go buy a copy of one of our games on the website. So that's directly. So you know, they'll, and and usually you know that'll that'll pay for uh, for shipping as well. The consumer pays for shipping there. So. Um, that that's the way you know we would prefer people get the game because we make the most money from from that. Um, but uh, there are so many other ways to do it too. Um, another way would be to um, sell. It. We we could sell it to a retailer. So you got a friendly local game store, um, and and you go in to buy your game there. So we would sell um, a copy of Good Cop Bad Cop to a retailer. Um, another way would be through uh, a distributor. So um, distributors work with, uh, they, they buy uh, many, many, many copies of games, you know, at a discounted price, and then they can distribute it to all the retailers out there, from the local game stores, even Target, Walmart, that kind of thing, too. Um, so, or, or online uh, stores as well. So something like Cool Stuff Inc., some of the bigger ones, um, Miniature Market, they will uh, they'll, they'll also buy in large quantities because they have so many people going um, to buy games from, from those websites. So um, go through a distributor. So distributor, we give them a great discount, and they distribute it in large quantities all over the Internet and you know, the country and the world, possibly, too. Probably the best way to get your game out there for mass consumption and make a name for yourself. Definitely. But you make, we would make far less on those copies. We have to give them a huge discount, so we make far less on those copies. So give me an example. How much does Good Cop Gun Pass, how does this cost? Yeah, fourteen ninety nine. dollars So buy MSRP. So if I'm a customer, I'm going to buy from your website. I want to pay 15 bucks. Yep. Plus shipping. Yes. And how much is shipping? Um, for that, uh, we have it at five dollars. So I'm going to pay 20 bucks to get to get this game. Yep. And then how much of that do do, do you make as like a margin for a profit? Yeah. Um. I'll I'll let me go over that in one second. One okay. other one other uh, area. Uh, one other way. A common way to get it is through distributing. Uh, a distribution services company. So we use we use Impressions, for example. So Impressions has a whole bunch of connections with all the distributors out there. And so you know I don't I don't have connections with with many distributors. So um, you know Impressions has that. I can I can give them I can give them a, a, a nice discount on on games. Give them a whole bunch of copies, and then they will get it out to all the distributors. And there's many di distributors too out there. Um, so that's that's the other way. So yeah, pricing. Let's get into pricing. So. Forty ninety nine for good cop bad cop. Um, if I were to give it to um, a distribution services company, um, should we start there? Sure. So um, impressions, um, I will I will sell it to. Um, well, impressions will help me sell it to distributors at a sixty percent discount. So uh, they'll be paying uh, forty percent of fourteen ninety nine. Uh, so it's six dollars. So they'll be paying six dollars for uh, every copy of good cop bad cop. And then impressions will get a cut of that. So the um, the six dollars that that we get, um, they get eighteen percent of that. Um, so that'll pay for for just kind of their services, but then also shipping from their warehouse, the impressions warehouse, out to the distributor. So they pay for that too. That that's around eight percent or so. So they get about a ten percent cut of the six dollars too. It's not of the fourteen ninety nine. It's of the okay. six dollars. Um, so that would be um, let's see. I think I have that a dollar eight would be would be their their cut of it, um, and then we would get the remaining. So we would get four dollars and ninety two cents. 
So that that's through that that has the most layers. You know, we've got a few middlemen before it gets from us to a consumer. But the broadest reach. Exactly. So now now you're you're selling your your game in a game store in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. which you would never have otherwise reached. You're getting yep. a sale that you would that would have gotten away. That you yep. would not have gotten. Yep. But you're only making five bucks. Yep. Or even less because you got to deduct your cost of goods. So yep, yeah, and we you know uh, somebody not the consumer pays the shipping then too. All they do is they get themselves to their friendly local game store and buy it there. So they get a little cheaper price too. They don't have to pay for shipping from anybody for that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that that's um, that has the most middlemen. But I, I suppose we could go straight to a distributor too. Um, a distributor is going to pay. Um, they're they're no matter who they get it from, they're probably going to pay that forty percent of the cost of the game. So they're always going to get a 60% discount no matter where they go. Uh, but then... If and that's, that's a standard industry practice, right? It is. Right? It really is. Yep. In general, yep. in retail, that the, a retailer wants to buy a product for half of what they're going to sell it for. Yep. So the retailer wants to buy this for, for a seven fifty. dollars yep. and then sell it for $15. Bucks yep. So that that covers their rent and their salary for their salespeople and their utilities and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. That, and so that's you know, what, I'm, what I'm really paying for when I buy something from the store is the ability just to go there and pick it up. Yep. For them to stock it and to have that, that real estate with to have that there. And so it, generally in retail, it's it's a, a double markup. That's, that's yep. typical. And I just want to call out the difference between a distributor and a retailer because there is a lot of confusion between them. Uh, so retailer is your friendly local game store. Or it's more... Yes. Yep. Yes. Yep. Um, or, but now it's kind of the internet. You know, it's some of the major, okay. uh, the larger websites too where you can go that is not the publisher. So that's going to you know a website that's not us. Uh, over world game. So okay. Um, so that's a retailer. Distributor gets the copies in mass quantities out to all the retailers. So they're kind of a middleman between the publisher and the retailer. And the distributor is not making a lot of money. They're they're do going for volume. Absolutely. So that's why they're yes. buying hundreds of copies of games because they're they're only making you know fifty that cents. Dollar in this eight. example, yeah, they give us, oh, like a buck. Yep. And but they're doing right. hundreds of those, and so yeah. that's why it's worthwhile because they're saying okay, we're going to ship this game store. They want you know five copies of this and ten copies of this. We make one big box and ship it off to that game store with all the stuff that they need. Yep. And so a distributor needs sixty percent off because a retailer needs fifty percent off. So that ten percent is the profit that the distributor makes. You know, but then there's all there's other fees in there too. You know, shipping is going to be you know is a cost too that somebody has to pay for. So, uh, but that comes out of that uh, ten percent. So um, and then the so the other ways to get it would be through like straight to you know straight to a consumer. So that's easy. Go to becoming much more popular today with Kickstarter. Absolutely. Yes. So Kickstarter is another way to go uh, directly from a publisher to a consumer. So it's it's a it's a way for the publisher to get a l little bigger you know part of the of the pie. And there's so many other reasons to use Kickstarter too for marketing and such. One of the things you might lose doing Kickstarter, however, would be uh, your own particular time, your own time, because now you're not paying someone, and you're getting a lot more of the profit, yep. but it's going to take, you have to mail off every single one of your copies to either the retailers themselves or customers who buy it directly from you. Definitely, yep. And, and the price of, the you know, the MSRP is, you know, what the fourteen ninety nine for good cop, bad cop, but how much do we price it as a reward level on a Kickstarter campaign? You know that's a that's a tough question. You know that that doesn't have a black and white answer, and it depends on you know how the cost of the game. So this is a cheap game. Fifteen bucks is cheap for a game. You know most of them are going to be you know closer to you know forty bucks or so. So um, that's going to be a big difference too. Like, do you give your backers a discount? You know, too by let's say it's still a fifteen dollar game. Do we sell this to our backers for twelve dollars and give them a nice discount? You know, but then if you cut your cut margin to a lot low and something goes wrong. Then you're in trouble. Now you can lose your money. I, I have I three examples of that. <laughs> Jeremy likes to tell these stories. Soon. We're going to let him <laughs> go ahead and uh, talk about them. Which one would you like to talk about first? Uh, let, let's talk about burning things up, because I think that that's a good place to start. Sounds good to me. So the other thing we think about, if, if you do Kickstarter, you're going to keep a lot more of the money. So let's say Brian does do this, and it's a $15 pledge level on Kickstarter. It's the same pledge level as, as you would sell for your MSRP. But then you say, oh, but that covers the shipping, too. Shipping is included. Brian has to figure out how much it's really going to cost him to ship this all over the world and what he's going to pay and all that. And then he also has to decide, is he going to personally package and mail every single one of these? I mean, maybe with a thousand backers. Is he, gonna, is he going to hand wrap and hand address a thousand packages 
and send them all. And, and this is a small game, but what if his game was like one of those sizes? Is he going to stack them all in his garage when they come in the trucks from China on pallets and then hand process them all and pack them all and ship them? And anything you do to make that cheaper, um, printing off your labels, yep. uh, going somewhere to in order to get that done at a quicker rate than handwriting every one of them, that's got to cut into your costs as well. Yep, and it's more labor for you. So you might use a fulfillment company to do that for you where they're mailing things out and warehousing it for you, but then you have to pay them a cut like you would the distributor and you have to pay that fulfillment company. So, so like everything, if you want to get more, if you want to get a bigger cut out of it, it's going to take way more of your own effort and time. Absolutely. So I'll give you some examples here of, of people who did not figure that out correctly. Uh, so there was a, a famous board game called uh, Glory to Rome, and there was this game company called Cambridge Games Factory. And this is a great game. It is a great game. It's a fantastic game. I love this game. It's an amazing game. And it looks really nice. And so they had it. <laughs> it was very successful. <laughs> Uh, and uh, one of the more successful games, but it had kind of cheap art that they had put it together with to get it to market. And so they said, well, this is our, our, like our most well-loved game. What we really want to do is commission a new edition of it with better art. So we're going to use our Kickstarter to raise money to pay an artist for a nicer set of artwork and reissue the game in a nice box with nice artwork and, and really do it up right. And so they did that, and it was very successful. So they got $73,000, they had 1,600 backers, uh, and but they had done their campaign with free shipping anywhere in the world. Saying, hey, if you back Glory to Realm on Kickstarter, we're going to send it to you no matter where you are in the world. And through fulfilling that and mailing them all out and paying for all that shipping and some other factors as well, it wasn't solely the Kickstarter, what happened is the company wound up going bankrupt and the guy wound up losing his house. Uh, because the shipping cost a lot more than he thought. It took a lot more time than he thought. It was very time-consuming. Uh, Australia, in particular, proved to be really difficult to mail things to. When they did their initial fulfillment, they forgot an entire state. And then everybody who was in that state was very upset that they didn't get their games and other people did. Uh, and so it was... Now Now this game, which I think on Kickstarter was like 40 bucks or 50 bucks, goes for like $120 on eBay because it's so rare. Uh, and that's that's kind of a lesson of planning ahead. You know, one thing I'll, yeah. I'll point out there. So if you if you make a mistake and you're off by a dollar, we'll say you're off by a dollar. That's it's okay if you only have a few hundred backers. But when you get to five thousand backers, now you just made a five thousand dollar mistake. So you know, just imagine that with shipping, it gets extremely expensive. And if you make, you can easily make a mistake that's going to be add $3 to every single copy. Mm -hmm. It could potentially, if you cut your margin too low, like if you were doing this for 10 bucks on Kickstarter, yep. and then you have a mistake like that, now you, you could go in the hole, or you can make anyone at all, which is yep. not good, especially, like if I back a game on Kickstarter, really what I want it to see that game successful, not just one off, but maybe I get an expansion for it, it gets reprinted, and I want to see that game going in the future. And if it kind of blows up after the Kickstarter campaign, that means I'm never getting an expansion for that game. I'm never going to, like, oh, we're going to do a second printing, or we're going to correct this one card that was off, and you'll be able to order that replacement card from a website. I don't get any of those benefits, because it just it tanks and dies. Not to mention, if you like the game, and the game designer goes broke, you're Yeah, right. Not I hurt this guy. Yeah. This guy I wanted to support. You know, I, I, you know, I hurt that guy. That's terrible. It was a famous one. The most famous one from Kickstarter, blowing up from shipping and fulfillment, is a, a comic book. And so if you Kickstarter, if you... Google, like, Kickstarter burning comic books. So this guy, he raised 50K on his Kickstarter campaign to make his webcomic into a comic book and got a lot of backers for that. And then the fulfillment and shipping overwhelmed him. He just he, he couldn't handle it. Uh, and he had so many people messaging him, oh, when am I going to get my comic book? When that's, when's he going to fulfill that? When is going to happen? That he got really frustrated, and so he burned the comic books and made a video of that and posted it, saying, "Stop asking me! I I burned them." <laughs> and that it was just it was too much to handle. So that you had to factor in. And then the other guy that um, I know and and uh, Brian knows is James Matthew, who has a great blog, writes all about Kickstarter and publishing games and modeling your costs and planning and paying for advertising. He had a campaign where he did these metal coins, and it was very successful. He got Almost 100k on Kickstarter, 1500 backers for these just these metal coins as an, an add-on for another game or use as a component in other games. But what he didn't anticipate is how difficult they were to mail, and so the post office wound up eating a huge chunk of these packages. He would send out, they would get caught in the post office machines, and they were the too coins, thick. Is that a, and, okay. and they wouldn't, well, they wouldn't bend. The coins would all leak out of the ripped package. 
The, the backer would never get the coins. He'd have to mail it again. And now he's mailed it twice. Now he's not making any money. And he got mm -hmm. stuck on the second time. Now the third time. Now he's losing as much as he made initially. And so that kind of blew up on him. And it, it's metal, so they're heavy. Yeah, they're so heavy. It's they're not expensive cheap. to ship. It's yeah, not yeah. Cheap to ship. And so he he wrote a, a very good blog post about that, about planning for that, and how that can, can blow up in your face, and the, and the lessons learned there. So when you're when you're doing so, the Kickstarter is like, oh, I can keep more of my MSRP, you know, more of my target price. I'm going to pocket that, but then I also have to do the fulfillment, and I have to correctly budget for shipping, and that's a thing that a lot of people struggle with. Okay, so tell me about price points. Tell me about how you should, uh, uh, what it, some basic guidelines for uh, for costing your game. Hmm. That's uh, that's a tough tough question. Um, well, you need to make some money, uh, but you know if you can if you can price it so that you make you know it, it really depends on the price of the game too. Because like so, fourteen ninety nine for good cop bad cop. Um, we're gonna make. A very small, so you know, we, we probably we make so the the cost of making this for us was three dollars and seventeen cents per copy. Um, so if we get it through, can we talk about that? Yeah. So yeah. So three seventeen. So that's just to to manufacture it and to ship it to me. So so this game is all cards. Yep. Right. Yep. And did you deliberately decide to do your first game as a hundred percent card game? Yeah. Yeah. Why, why did you make that decision? Um, mainly because a, a standard deck of cards is 54 cards. So you have you have manufacturers all over the U.S., which is important, but also you know in other countries in, in China who can manufacture 54 cards in a very inexpensive way. And they already have their templates all set up. They're you know it's a very smooth process to manufacture a 54 card game, but also very cheap. So that's why we went with a 54 card game. It was actually the the Dice Hate Me 54 card challenge where we kind of came up with it, we we decided we're going to make a game and entered in that contest. And then um, we got such uh, positive feedback and became so attached to it that we decided to just do it ourselves. But um, it was an easy way to to get started, you know, in the industry, you know. And then our next game, New Salem, you know, adds it's still primarily card based, but now it adds some some more components, some cardboard. Okay, so. Yeah, so you had cubes, cubes but that was a stretch cubes. Goal. Initially, to yep. manage your, your cost and your price point, you were all cards. Yes. And yep. Unless you, you hit a certain amount of money where the scale would justify buying cubes now. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so we only manufactured 1,050 copies in our first print run of Good Cop, Bad Cop. Um, so that's, that's very, very low compared to the industry. But, but because it's a 54 card game, we get um, the, the companies who manufacture it are more flexible. Um, most other you know, popular manufacturers of tabletop games require at least 1,500 copies to be manufactured. But that's not the case with a 54 card game. So, you know, any new designers or publishers out there, I always recommend start with a 54 card game. Um, and Eric Vogel, who is the designer of a whole bunch of games, you can, you can Google him. He's here in the Bay Area. He has the exact same philosophy. He goes, see if you can make a 54 card game. This is a great challenge for you as a game designer. If you can make a game with so few components, and because it's cheap to produce. This is one you can actually get signed. This is one you can actually get published yourself if you want to because it's going to be much more feasible to do an all-card game with 50 or less. Now, it's, depending on the manufacturer, you might actually be able to do 60 or less oh, and, yeah. get, and get away with it. Uh, as, as I'm looking at developing games, one of the things we look at is if it's an all-card game, it's cheaper to make. And there are certain points you can hit. So 54 is one of them. You can also hit, uh, like the U.S. Playing Card Company, which is a huge company that does on-demand, like printing for cards, their press sheet is two decks. So 108 mm -hmm. cards. So you go up to 108 uh, cards and still fit there. Uh, Asmodee, the guys who just bought Days of Wonder, they have a certain size game that comes in a tin about yay big with their timeline and card line line of games. And that uses a press sheet with narrower European cards, and that's 110 cards on a press sheet. So you your game to 110 cards or less, they can print it on a single sheet. It's very cheap and easy for them to, to print that out and iterate. It's more appealing for the publisher to pick up. Or if you decide to self-publish, it's more practical, more feasible for you to source that and to get that done. And depending on the manufacturer, too, you might even be able to do... You can do 10 copies. You can do one copy if you want, some manufacturer. So, you know, if you only get 200 backers on Kickstarter, you know, maybe you only get, you know, $2,000. But you can set your goal that low. Where you can just be like, yeah, I hope 200 people want my game. You know, if I can if I can sell 200 people on this through Kickstarter, you know, that's that's something that isn't too hard to do. And then you can just manufacture that many. Of course, the cost now is you're talking like 
eight, nine bucks per copy, possibly. So the more you manufacture, the lower it's going to go. You mentioned a, a short run print on demand guy. So let's say, let's say I do, I do want to do a Kickstarter game. I made this game. I'm proud of it. I'm happy. It's not for everybody. I don't think it's going to blow up big, but I really want to publish it and get it out there. And I think I'm going to do 500 backers on Kickstarter. And that's you know too low to meet the minimum order of a larger scale printer. I think for the U.S. US uh, uh, print, printing card company, it's too low for them too. It's, it's even like for for them, it's it's uh, two thousand, two thousand or five thousand every it's for some of the really big U.S. manufacturers of of, of like poker decks. Minimum order, it's yeah. like two, three, four, five thousand. So who can I use if I need to print five hundred copies? Um, what we were going to do with the uh, good cop bad cop is we were going to use a company called Liberty. Um, so I don't know if you've heard of it or not, but um, they would they had no minimum. You Where could, would I find them on the internet? I don't know. I don't know that. Uh, Google, <laughs> Google, Google, yeah. Yeah. Google, Google, Google. We'll put it in the show notes. Just Google them. <laughs> Liberty Playing Card Company or something like that. But that's who we were going to go with um, if we didn't get enough backers. So we had that planned out. So basically, you know, if we got under, but we had a, a goal of uh, three thousand, I believe, was our goal for Good Cop Bad Cop. Our funding goal on Kickstarter. We can, we can. We can do that. You know, that's not too hard to to get. Uh, but if we would have just barely made it, we would have used Liberty, um, and the quality wouldn't have been quite as good. Um, but because we got past our threshold, we then switched over to Ad Magic, um, and Ad Magic made uh, Cards Against Humanity. Yep. They they printed that, so uh, they're a bigger company. Um, but um, it wouldn't have made sense unless we got to a certain uh, point. So once we passed that, we switched over to Ad Magic. Now you're getting you know higher quality linen finish playing cards. Um, and 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 they were they were also pretty flexible. You know, we did a thousand fifty copies of this. You know, which a lot of manufacturers won't do. How many backers did you have on Kickstarter? We had for good cop, bad cop, three right around three fifty. Okay, so you printed off an extra seven hundred copies. Yes. Now is that for the distributor? Yeah. So we had we gave six hundred copies to uh, Impressions, our distribution okay. services company. Oh, now before, before we do that, can I mention yeah. as a resource? So if I'm a designer yeah. out there and I do need to do a short print run. Because I'm, I'm only going to get 350 backers, and I want to be done with it. I want to get my game in the world, and I'm not going to, you know, fulfill it, and I want to I be done. And you're not interested in getting it out to stores? and Or maybe I just want to do a proof of concept. I want to get it out okay. there, and then have people try it out, build some buzz, get some reviews for it, and then try to sell it to a publisher, saying, hey, we had a successful Kickstarter, these people love the game, and now you could reprint it with higher quality components and do a larger print run, and I made a proof of concept that there is actually demand for this game, and it's a good game. You can use... The Game Crafter, and the Game Crafter, they have a service now where they'll print any number of copies. They'll print 263 copies if you want, and they'll fulfill it for you too. So your margins are going to be really tight because their price per copy is a lot higher because these guys are doing all the labor for you and they're building it all in Wisconsin and mailing it out. But you can do a low print run uh, through the Game Crafter, and the quality is not as good as, as this is. A larger print run is on a bigger, nicer press, and has nicer color and nicer cardstock. Um, you can also do very short print runs on demand uh, through drive through cards, drive through cards.com. I've ordered from them before, and from Print and Play Productions on the West Coast. And what this lets you do is maybe you only want to print 10 copies. You could print 10 copies from one of these on-demand printers and send that out to bloggers or reviewers for your game or mail it off as demo copies to publishers. And now you have the flexibility. You don't even have to meet a minimum order of 500. You have three services that you can use if... So I should mention that drive through cards is only cards. They can only do cards. Both Print and Play Productions and the Game Crafter can do cards, chipboard, tokens, and a variety of components for you, boxes, things like that. A drive through cards also doesn't do boxes. They like mail you their, your stack of cards in a rubber band or in cellophane, and then you have to package them yourself. But they have really good card stock and really good quality printing. Uh, so I've ordered from all three services, and I like all three, and they each have their advantages and disadvantages. So here's a couple examples. They're still good, um, good quality. Um, if you want to maybe hold that up to the camera, that's uh, the Game Crafter. So it's, it's still nice yep. quality cards. Um, you know, we, we would have been... We should, we, should, we should do the flick test here. So how well it, it flicks yeah. or bends and then unbends... So that one stays a little bent. So that's that's you know that's cheaper cardstock. Or if I had nicer cardstock, I could bend it. And yep. we'll do it. So let's, let's do magic. Yep. So magic is going to have I can bend magic like this, and oh well, it's still a little bent, yeah, yeah, but yeah. It, it's got a lot more uh, stiffness to it and the ability to unbend. Uh, 
because they're using a larger scale print run. Yep. And here's drive through cards. Um, this is a Daniel Solis's game, uh, Penny Farthing Catapults. Um, if you want to, you can bend that. It's a I, little I, I like, yeah, I like, I like so, the, I like the, the drive through cards ones. They have good, good, good color production and they have good card stock. Uh, but you know, they can't do packaging. They can't do fulfillment. Uh, and their requirements to get a file up into them, you need to learn something about pre-press. And you have to understand how to do CMYK color management and layout and things like that in order to get your file of your game into their website to print out. The result you get back is very nice. It is nice. It feels a little bit more plasticky. It is. Like, uh, it's, 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 you, can, you, can, you can tell the difference yep. in the, the card quality in bulk. Directed cards, only cards, but man, they're nice cards. But, but I would say most people, even you know, with uh, the Game Crafter cards here, uh, they're not really going to notice. They're not going to care too much. Right. You can put them in sleeves. It's not like they look terrible. I'm playing the game. Games. I'm yeah. the game. I, bought, I think I bought like 20 games in the Game Crafter, and I, I've been very happy. So yes. they, they, they're, the, only, the only thing I don't like is their boxes are terrible. But other than that, they're I, getting I, better. I don't they're getting better. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I agree. They're getting better, though. We're talking about the different targets you can hit: fifty-four cards, sixty cards, hundred and eight cards. And the reason you're doing this is for the eventual pricing of your game. If you can hit a certain magic number, the production of cost of your game is a lot lower. Then you can achieve a price point that's more reasonable to get people in when you're planning out pricing your cost to the final price of your game. Uh, when I make games, if I do tokens or plastic ships or anything like that, those all start costing more and more money. Especially so they have plastic parts and they require molds and there's more things i got to do on. So a lot of games you'll see, like let's say Suburbia, Suburbia is all made out of cardboard pieces. And this is called chipboard or punchboard. It's this thick cardboard, like your notebook is made out of, and they just punch things out of it. And chipboard is generally very cheap. To manufacture it. You just print on this cardboard layer and then you have a die cutter, punch it out, and you're good to go. So the cheapest kind of game you can make and hit a, a low price point is all cards and a limited number of cards. The second cheapest thing you can do is cards and chipboard or all chipboard. And that's why you see a lot of board games that just use those components, just cardboard, chipboard, and or these. Or they use a standard size cube because again that's like we have a love letter on the shelf over there. And that, that little red cube it comes with is kind of a standard size cube. I can order that in mass. It's not a custom cube. Uh, standard pawn type pieces that you would yep. have in, you know, like Sari or something like that. Right. Those I, I see very commonly. But once you start getting to the molded plastic, like in Tesoro, the ship one, the, right. the, the molded ships, those have that to That cost them a lot of money. To do those plastic ships in, in Tesoro of the, of the seas, they had to hit a certain level of production, they say, well, we're, it's, it's only going to make sense to pay for the molds to be made for these ships if we can sell, you know, a hundred thousand copies of this game, or we can sell five thousand copies of this game, depending on how complex you're manufacturing it. You back that one? I back to serve the seas, uh, and so they—that was a sequel. So they already knew that it was going to do pretty well. They're adding more to it, and the ships. I actually look. The ships might have been a stretch goal. They might have started out. You're just going to get re more regular ponds and then made the little custom plastic ships when they reached a certain funding level, a certain backer layer level, because now it's practical for them to order that, that custom component. Okay. You wanted to add something? Um, just that, um, that that's exactly where the funds from stretch goals come from. You know, where, yeah. you know, if, if, I, if I manufacture 2,000 copies of Good Cop, Bad Cop, you know, it's going to be maybe $1.90 per copy. But uh, if I only do 1,000, it's going to be more like, you know, three twenty. So that, that money, and then multiplied by the number of copies that you, you uh, get back, the number of backers that you have that want to get a copy, so that, that is where the money comes from. So if we get, if we get uh, 2,000 uh, 2, backers, um, that's going to be that's going to be a lot of, you know, 2,000 times the discount you get to go from 1,000 to 2,000 is going to be where that, those funds go uh, come from. So if you, if you fund an additional, you know, two thousand dollars on a campaign, um, it's not the money isn't. It's not we have a free two thousand dollars, you know, that we can do anything no, we want with. You, you have, know, right. three hundred dollars. Exactly. Not yeah. even that. It's not <laughs> even that. Yeah. You know, it's it's more like you know you have you have uh, you know fifty bucks or hundred bucks to work with. You know, to add you know a little bit of additional complexity to uh, to make up that that amount. So. Can I tell another story about component costs and how that factors in? So you said the more copies of the game I make, in general, the cheaper per copy it is going to manufacture. I'm getting what's called economies of scale. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to give you an example of that. You said you also hit entered, 
the uh, Dice Hate Me 54 card challenge, and that's where this had come from. We didn't like, enter it. We were going to enter it. That's oh, you where, really? Yeah. You no, we never did. It. We were oh. just like, screw this, we're going to make this game ourselves. Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's a good story, <laughs> nonetheless. A good story, nonetheless. So, the, uh, and you also mentioned Ad Magic, who does Cards Against Humanity, and that's where they're kind of most well known for it, being the manufacturer behind that and sort of the publisher behind that as well. Uh, they, they hold a contest every year with the Cards Against Humanity guys called the Tabletop Deathmatch. Where people enter different games, and the top game gets published through them. Uh, and the tabletop deathmatch, we should talk about some other time about how that contest works, but I have a buddy in Nebraska, and he owns and operates a board game cafe called Spielbound. It's a not-for-profit board game cafe, and one of the guys in his local area developed his own prototype game, which they thought was really good, and entered it in the tabletop deathmatch, and actually made it up into the first levels of cuts. So there's thousands of games enter it, and they do like rounds, and you go further up in there. And he actually made it through a few levels because this game was good enough to make it through a little cut. So I, I heard about this from my buddy Caleb, who runs the Borgen Cafe. Like, oh, it's like so and so, my local guy made this game. We played it. It's a really good game. We like it. I uh, entered the contest. He put it up on the Game Crafter, and I'm like, oh, I'll go order a copy of this game from the Game Crafter and play it and try it out. So I get there on the Game Crafter, and the Game Crafter is charging you per component. So let's say it's 11 cents per card for every card in my game. That adds up to the cost of my game. His game was $90 on the Game Crafter because it used so many components, and the cost per component was high because he's only printing a few copies of this game. So I really wanted to play this game, but I wasn't willing to pay 90 bucks to try it out. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Well, thank you all for joining us this week. Uh, we'll come back next week. We have an idea of what we're going to continue the discussion for. Um, I've been Richard New. This is Jeremy Commander and Brian Hink, and this is for Ben Lynn Podcast. Thanks for joining us.